Our guest of honor tonight with our Extreme Seminar Series is Dolphin, Slammer Dolphin, right here. Does everybody not want this picture? Right, is this not the photo right here? Okay, and if you want the fish to look bigger, make sure you hold the head up closer to the camera, right? That's the shot that we all want right there. Now, in order to get you that shot, in order to catch this fish right here, it's not so easy, we all know that, okay? It's not easy. We have to learn a lot about this dolphin. We have to learn a lot about the fish, its feeding characteristics, its habits, and that will allow us to really zero in on these bigger slammers. Keep in mind, I certainly do not claim to be an expert angler by any means whatsoever. I'm just some guy who loves the fish. Okay. My entire life revolves around it between the magazine, the television series, our Instagram page, which by the way, make sure you check us out at instagram.com forward slash Florida Sport Fishing. Of course, the same on Facebook. And also for the new faces here, all of our previous seminars are available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Florida Sport Fishing. You can watch all of the seminars there. And of course, this one will be posted in the near future as well. Putting that aside again, let's get back to our guest of honor here, the bull dolphin, the slammer dolphin. Remember that tonight's seminar is not about dolphin fishing in general, because again, we're really focusing on the bigger fish. The smaller dolphin are called what? Peanuts, peanuts the small ones, right? Peanuts we call them, the little babies, little chickens, peanuts. And then it goes up from there, the next size up would be schoolies, exactly, you know, fish that swim in abundant schools. And then the next size up from schoolies would be gaffers, fish that are in the 10, 15 pound range that, of course, you need a gaff to get them up and in the boat. And then beyond that 20 pound size, that's really what we call those slammers, fish in the 25, 30, 35, 40, and of course, all the way on up to 50 pounds. Though that's what we're going to talk a lot about tonight, okay? It's fish like that, so you can go out there and get that hero shot, okay, with this guy. Remember that dolphins are the fastest growing fish in the ocean, the fastest growing pelagic game fish. Here are some fun facts. A dolphin can grow to how large in one year? Anybody know? Okay, 20 pounds is a good estimate. 50. There was a dolphin that was captured by the University of Miami, the School of Rosenthal, the, the organization there that does a lot of testing on game fish species. They captured a juvenile dolphin that was five pounds. They kept it in captivity, fed that fish a constant healthy diet nonstop, as much food as that fish wanted to eat for an entire year, okay? In one year, that fish gained 52 pounds, 52 pounds. Think about that, okay? That's a pound a week, okay? Of course, ideal conditions, unlimited food, ideal water temperature, you know, everything had to be perfect. But at the end of the day, the fish gained 52 pounds. The average, okay, the average is approximately about a pound to two pounds per month. So a 15 to 20 pound fish is a year old. Okay, and of course a 25 pound fish could be a year old. It all depends on that fish's feeding habits over its lifetime and the abundant, abundance of forage that it had access to, the conditions where it lived. But we know that they grow super, super fast. At five months of age, they reach maturity and they start to spawn at five months of age. Every spawning cycle, those fish will lay approximately 80 to 100,000 eggs. And they will do that no less than one time per week on a continuous basis. Now that's important to think about because at five months old, that fish is popping out 100,000 eggs a week, okay? You're looking for a fish that's 30 pounds or larger. What does that mean to you? You're not going out here looking for one in a million. You're going out here looking for one in a hundred million. Think about that. One in a hundred million of those little eggs may make it to this size right here. So this one fish really beat the odds, obviously, in the statistics greatly. 
because all of those eggs, the vast majority, and all of the juvenile dolphin are gobbled up and eaten by everything, including dolphin. Dolphin's favorite food is dolphin. Do you want to know why? You're damn right it's good. <laughs> Any way you cook it, it's good, right? It's the reason that they feed on dolphins so much is because juvenile dolphin is the most abundant forage offshore. Okay, there's so many juvenile dolphin that the larger bulls and cows obviously just gobble them up. And it's not only because they're good, but again, because they're so abundant. So really, at the end of the day, such a small percentage of all dolphin, of all of those eggs, actually make it even to maturity. Remember that a dolphin's goal, a fish's goal, the dolphin, is to replace itself. So think about that. The fish goes out there, a female little cow, and she starts laying 80,000 eggs a week. And her hope, her goal, her reason for living is to replace herself with one living dolphin. Not one out of every batch, not one every month, not one every year, just one, okay? Not to double the population, because imagine if two survived to maturity. Wouldn't our entire population of dolphin double in one year and then double the next year or quadruple? It doesn't work like that. Otherwise, we'd all be out there right now sinking the boat with dolphin. There'd be so many of them. And you and I know that that isn't exactly the case, is it? Okay, it can be very challenging. So throughout that fish's entire life cycle, its goal is to replace itself with one fish. Absolutely amazing. They're an amazing, amazing game fish. If you think this is a stupid fish that's dumb, that will jump on any bait and anybody can catch them, you are sadly mistaken. Of course, the little ones, you can go out there on a wood line, throw some chunks, and have a hundred little dolphin that are two to four pounds surrounding the boat, and you keep 20 of them, and you think you're a dolphin superstar, right? Okay? I'm sorry. Anybody can do that. You're looking for this fish, and you might as well call this fish Superman, okay? Because it survived the odds and beat all of the odds and did everything it needed to do to reach this size. Dolphin also migrate thousands of miles, thousands of miles. This is not a fish that moves five miles or stays in one spot. This is a fish that will swim upwards of 100 miles a day, okay? 100 miles a day. And over the course of an annual migration pattern, it is not uncommon for a dolphin to, you know, literally swim thousands and thousands, five to 10,000 miles. Their migratory route is all the way up the East Coast, throughout the Sargasm Sea, and all the way back down the Atlantic into the Caribbean, and it's a big loop, and all the way back up the East Coast of Florida, or the East Coast of the United States. Okay? It's a giant loop that all dolphin follow. That's what they do. They do not sit in one spot. They do not hang out in one area like a snapper or a grouper. They're constantly on the move. Now that's important because you could go out there today, and we're going to put our buddy away here for a second. Thanks for being such a superstar. Okay? You could go out here today and catch absolutely nothing. Okay, anybody ever go dolphin fishing and catch no dolphin? Okay, who's not, almost everybody's raising their hand. Okay. And whoever's not raising their hand has either never gone dolphin fishing, okay, or is fibbing. Okay, because the truth of the matter is it happens to all of us. They're not all over the place all of the time. That's just not what really happens, okay? However, you could go out today and catch zero, catch no dolphin, you're flagged, catch no dolphin whatsoever. But you go tomorrow and you can load the boat because, again, these fish move upwards of 100 miles a day. So the fish that they're catching off Key Largo today could be right here out of Pompano tomorrow. Or the fish that you catch out of Pompano today could be up off of Stewart or somewhere tomorrow. So, again, it's a fish that is constantly moving. Don't judge what happened today on what may happen tomorrow because it's a constantly changing environment and don't use that as a gauge because again, these fish are constantly on the move. Dolphin grow so fast, why? Because they eat so much. They have two purposes on this earth. One is to replace themselves so they mate 
a lot. They spawn a lot. The other purpose is to eat. They're eating machines. They are one of the only game fish that has such a diversified diet. I'm one of those guys when I catch a dolphin, or really when I catch any fish, I cut it open, I fillet it, I gut it, whatever it is that I'm doing, and I'm inspecting that belly. I'm fascinated by, by what's inside a fish's stomach. Sometimes I can't even identify what's in there. I'm like, what is that weird thing? You know, but certainly you'll see in dolphin a wide variety of forage. You'll see crabs, you'll see shrimp, you'll see other dolphin, of course, flying fish, ballyhoo, goggle eyes, runners, anything, anything they can catch. Turtles, okay, dolphin love to eat turtles. Okay, there have been dolphin that have been caught that have had over 20 little baby turtles inside their stomachs. Okay, it's an easy meal to catch. Seahorses, they eat seahorses. They eat everything. And what's cool is sometimes you cut them open, especially these larger dolphin, and they may have some sort of forage, like a little squid or a shrimp that's the size of your pinky nail, and then right next to it is a flying fish this big. You know, it's, that fish will eat anything at any time. And that, of course, is what fuels that fish's growth rate. And it needs all of that fuel because it's constantly moving and it's constantly migrating and constantly looking for food because it's constantly mating. You know, that's their whole cycle, their whole cycle. So we know that the smaller dolphin, the schoolies, the peanuts, etc., are schooling fish, right? They're schooling fish, they're, they're abundant, they swim in aggregated schools that may contain a hundred or more fish. As they grow and get larger, that size of that school diminishes. So when they're schoolies or and they're under, you know, that five to eight pound range, that school may be 25 fish, 30 fish. When they're in that two to four pound range, the little peanuts, that school may be a hundred fish because all of the bait can support that size school. So in other words, a school of 100 two-pounders okay, only needs so much food, but a school of 120 pounders obviously needs a lot more food, and there just isn't that much forage, so those schools become smaller and smaller. And when they get to that slammer size, when they get to that size, our buddy over here, okay, that school is how big? Anybody know? Okay, often two to four fish. It is one male and the rest are females. Okay, always, that's, that's the rule. Okay, period, it doesn't go any other way. If you encounter a school of 30 pound dolphin, there's gonna be one dominant bull dolphin, okay, the man of the bunch, and the rest, may it be one or two or three more, are gonna be females, are gonna be cows. If you put two big bulls together in the same school, they will fight to the death, okay, to gain dominance over those cows. It's very much like a lion in a pack. There are no two big, you know, dominant male lions. It's the same thing with dolphin fish. There's one bull and then there are cows, okay? And sometimes, usually, we see one cow and one bull. So if you're trolling or running and gunning, and we're gonna talk about both, and you catch a really nice cow that's 20 to 30 pounds, what's, would it be a good idea to keep fishing in that area? Yeah. Hell yeah, that's right, because guess what? Daddy's right around the corner somewhere. Okay, I promise you that. Where there are the females, where there are the cows, the bull is not far behind, okay? He is somewhere. So, to go out and just catch dolphin, if you are just looking for action, which again is not what this seminar is about, but we all know how to do that. Take a bucket of chunks, you can go troll small feathers, you can go look for weed lines, you can do all of that kind of stuff. But how do we find these bigger fish? How do we segregate you know, these bigger fish from the smaller ones? You know, and what's the secret? What's the, the secret recipe for being able to go out there and catch these bigger slammers? Well, for starters, if you definitely want to catch dolphin in the 30 to 50 pound range, anybody want to catch dolphin in the 30 to 50 pound range? Yeah. Go to Costa Rica. <laughs> okay? That's first and foremost. Go to Costa Rica. 
because there's a lot of them in Costa Rica. You'll get tired of catching 30 to 50 pound dolphin. There's a lot of big dolphin in the Pacific because of the abundance of forage. Okay, I remember one trip, and certainly this seminar isn't about the Pacific, but one trip off of Costa Rica where our boat was surrounded by about a dozen dolphin. Smallest one, 30 pounds, biggest one, 60 pounds. Okay? And we were throwing blue rudders to try and catch the two 60 pounders, but we couldn't because as soon as the bait hit the water, a 30 to 50 pounder would jump on it. And I'm pulling blue rudders away from 50 pound dolphin. <laughs> but that's the reality of it because I wanted that fish of a lifetime. Never got it, but it was there. So again, if you're really looking for those bigger fish, there are great places on planet Earth where you can go and catch them. Here, it's much, much harder. There's so much more pressure, right? You go out, we've talked about this in every seminar. And it, was anybody out there on Sunday dolphin fishing? Okay, I was out there on Sunday. Do, whoa, whoa, just in this room alone. Raise your hands if you were out there on Sunday. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are about 25 people right here. Just in this small little room, 25 people that were out there on Sunday. I counted a couple of dozen boats, you know, just that I could see around me where I was deep dropping. There's so much pressure out there. And everything that we find, all of the weed lines that you guys were fishing, do you think you were the first person that was fishing that weed line? Come on now, okay? All the guys off Fort Lauderdale, off Miami, down off the Keys, that weed line's been pounded. Okay, and it will continue to be pounded all the way up the line. The fact that you caught anything, if you caught anything, it, you, I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, really, really tough. Certainly you're gonna have your good days. You know, we, we definitely go out there and have good days. One of my editors went out last weekend on his way out and like, I don't know, 900 feet or something, stumbled across something floating, some debris, and for the next hour, they just beat up on 15 to 20 pound fish until they couldn't catch anymore, and then came home. Okay, so I mean, it happens, we all know that. But on a regular basis, it's not as easy as it once used to be. So, one way to catch these bigger dolphin, we know is right here on the edge. And when I talk about the edge, I mean 100 feet of water, 150 feet of water, but understand that we are targeting a game fish that can be caught in 100 feet of water, one mile off the beach, in 1,000 feet of water, or in 3,000 feet of water, everywhere. You don't know where these big dolphin are gonna be. There's absolutely no way to know where these big dolphin are gonna be. It's not like any other species. You know when we're targeting swordfish, we know what depth we wanna be in. When we're targeting tilefish, we know what depth we wanna be in. When we're targeting king mackerel, or sailfish, or any of the other game fish, we know what depth we wanna be in. If you all had to get up tomorrow morning and pick a number, I want, when I say one, two, three, I want everybody to spit out a number as to where they think Okay, there's going to be slammer-sized dolphin in what depth? Ready? One, two, three. I don't even know what that was, right? I mean, I heard 200, I heard 1,200, I heard blah, blah, blah. Okay, everybody guessed a different number. That's dolphin fishing, especially for these bigger fish, and that's part of the, you know, the biggest challenge that we face is how do we get dialed in as to where these bigger fish are? One of the biggest mistakes I think that a lot of guys make is they fish by the radio, okay? They hear a buddy says, hey, I just caught a 20 pounder in 500 feet, and everybody goes Woof, right to 500 feet. Or you hear another boat go, yeah, we're beating them up on a log out here in 1200 feet, and everybody goes Woof, right to 1200 feet, okay? First of all, last time I checked, you cannot catch a dolphin that's already been caught and in somebody's cooler. Okay, that's first and foremost. You can't catch caught fish, all right? That's done, okay? And number two, I don't know. I don't really believe half the stuff that I hear on the radio. I don't believe half the shit I see on TV, let alone on the radio, okay? I'm telling you that right now. So you got to really pay attention to what's going on, you know? Don't fish by the radio. Fish by what you see out there, what the conditions are. Certainly it's good to digest information and to hear what other people are saying and doing, but don't be that guy that says, hey, let's just pick up everything and run out there to that depth real quick because that guy claims he caught a 20-pounder. And by the way, 
oftentimes, when somebody says they caught a 20-pound dolphin, how big is that dolphin? <laughs> all right, it's not 20 pounds. We all exaggerate on fish. If you don't exaggerate on the size of fish, you're lying. We all exaggerate. Right? We're guys. We exaggerate on size. Okay? We say that fish was bigger than it really was. Okay? We really do. So just pay attention, like I said. Yeah. So again, you know that you can catch this fish anywhere. And there are oftentimes big dolphin that are caught right on the edge by guys that are kite fishing. Okay, we're targeting sailfish and suddenly a 30 pound dolphin comes along and eats a goggle eye. Or you're trolling shrimp baits, picking mackerel, you've got a couple of value up on the surface, and out of nowhere a slammer dolphin comes in and eats a troll food. But that's not the problem. That's if I woke up and said, hey, I want to go catch a big dolphin. That's what my mission is to do. It's not about the quantity, it's about quality. If I've got my kite spread up, and if I say, hey, the only fish in this area are dolphin, then I, I may be likely to catch a dolphin. But there's sailfish, there's blackfin tunas, there's bonitas. There, anybody have their kite bait eaten by a bonita? Okay, that's always fun, right? There are bonitas, there are king mackerel. So all day long, you're dealing with all of these other species. You know what I'm saying? That it's hard to just single out those big dolphin and say, that's what I want to catch. So fishing right on the edge, in my opinion, for the bigger dolphin is not the way to go. So the next option is to run and gun. What is running and gunning? Running and gunning means leaving the inlet and I'm going. I'm heading east or southeast or northeast or wherever it is you're going, but you're going offshore. And I'm not stopping the boat until I see something. There's got to be something because there's so much water out there, right? It all looks the same. There's just so much water. Are dolphin everywhere? Are they everywhere? No, they're not, okay? They're not a dumb fish, especially at that size. They didn't get to be big by being dumb, okay? They know that they need to be around a good forage, you know, source of forage, and they know where that food is. So you can't just stop anywhere and expect to catch fish. It doesn't work like that. So running and gunning is about maximizing all of your efforts into smaller, likely key areas that are likely going to hold the bigger dolphin. Okay? Problem is, A, you're burning a lot of fuel. And depending on your boat, for example, my 39CV with triple 350 Verados cruising at 45 miles an hour, I'm burning, I don't know, a lot of money in fuel. Okay? Whatever it is, is a lot. Okay? Obviously, if there are other guys that are running four outboards or two outboards or whatever it is, you know, so you've got to be prepared to make that investment to say, hey, I'm willing to spend some extra money, burn some extra fuel, and take this gamble. Because it is a gamble. You don't know what you may or may not stumble across. And you leave early in the morning before everybody else gets out there. You know, you don't want, if you're that guy that leaves the dock on a Saturday at 11 a.m. and says, I'm going to go out and catch big dolphin. Are you that guy? No. This is that guy right here, everybody. Right here. <laughs> no. All right, sit next to him. Okay. The name of my boat is High Noon. <laughs> name of his boat is High Noon. That's great. So again, you obviously, if you're that guy that's leaving late in the morning thinking you're going to find those big dolphin, it's not going to happen. You need to get out there before everybody else. Problem is, we know when we go offshore looking for big dolphin, what's the first thing that we all look for? Reed lines, right? Who, we're all looking for reed lines. Everybody associates big dolphin or any size dolphin with reed lines. The problem is overnight, as the temperature drops, all of those little gas bubbles in sargasm weed lose their buoyancy and the reed lines suspend below the surface. As the sun comes up over the horizon and air temperatures and surface water temperatures begin to climb, those little gas bubbles, the tiny little grapes, so to speak, in the weeds, gain buoyancy and all the weed comes to the surface. 
which explains why you can go out there at 6 a.m., 6.30, 7 a.m. It's still relatively, you know, low light conditions. You're running offshore. You don't see any wind at all. It's nowhere. Wait two or three hours, and that same area that was barren now has wind lines everywhere. They were there first thing in the morning, too. You just flew right over them. You went past them. You didn't see them because they were below the surface. So that's often a problem with running and gunning in the morning. A lot of times you miss that really good structure because, again, it's suspended right below the surface. It's there. I promise you, it's there. You just don't see it. Okay, until that sun comes up. And a lot of people say, well, when the sun comes up, I could see better, and now I could see it. No, that's not the reason. It's because it was below the surface. That's why you didn't see it. And, and when I say below the surface, I don't mean it sunk to the bottom and then floated up. I mean just below the surface. So again, that's something to keep in mind with the running and gunning. However, you run offshore, everybody on the boat, if you do this properly, is all looking for something, something, okay? Everybody's looking. And one of the things that I think a lot of guys lack, a really important tool, is a good set of binoculars. Who owns a good set of binoculars? When was the last time you took out those binoculars when you were offshore dolphin fishing and were looking actually through the binoculars for structure? Okay, very few people. Okay, more than a few, but still a few, okay? If you own a pair of binoculars and you're going dolphin fishing, get them out of wherever they are. They're not doing you any good under your seat, in a hold, you know, down in the cabin. Put them up on the dash, okay, because you can see so much better. And oftentimes, listen, I've stumbled across a branch, literally one single branch that was just sticking out of the water, which ended up being a tree that was loaded in dolphin. But without being able to see that little branch with a pair of binoculars, I, I would have flew right by it, you know? So make sure that you use all of the tools that you have because you need everything on your side. You need all of those tools in order to be successful. So you're running offshore and you're looking, okay? And oftentimes you may see something two miles off the beach or 22 miles off the beach, depending on how far you want to go. The first thing that we look for, of course, is weed lines. We're going to talk more about that in a second. The next thing that we look for, which everybody said, is birds. Now, let's talk a lot about birds, because the best fishermen are birds. Okay, Birds are far better fishermen than you and I, Okay, because their livelihood, their life, depends on how good they fish. We just do it for fun. We just want that picture right, with the dolphin. That's why we do it, okay? They do it because they have to survive, so they have to be good at it. But you have to understand what you're looking at. You have to be able to read the birds. Understand, too, that my goal with these seminars is to share all of this information in the hope that you pick one thing out of it. If you only walk away from these seminars with one small thing, that could help you be a more successful angler, I feel like I've done my job. And this may, this may be one of those things. You're running offshore and you see a flock of birds, a whole flock, it's like National Geographic. You're like, oh my God, there's birds just going crazy, the whole bunch of them. And they're moving really, really fast. And you're super excited. Are there dolphin under those birds? Nope, absolutely, 100% not because those big flocks of birds that are all screaming and going crazy and diving down on the water in every direction, you know, and moving really fast, they are absolutely never on dolphin. They're on either small black fin tunas, skipjacks, bonitas, some sort of fast moving tuna species. Okay, that's what those big flocks of birds are on. If you see a frigate, is that a good sign? Okay, that's a great sign, right? Because frigates are an incredible bird. Keep in mind, they never land on water. They can't get wet, okay, at all. They're master hunters because they fly around and they know that they have to eat something that's in the air, okay? They literally cannot land on the water or get wet like all of the other birds. So they fly around. They've got phenomenal eyesight. They can see deep into the water. And it's believed that the height 
of the frigate off the surface is the height of what it's looking at below the surface. Okay, you kind of follow what I'm saying? So if that frigate is way up there just cruising around, he doesn't see nothing. He's just cruising. If he's 100 feet up and he's circling, we've all seen it, and he's cruising around like a jet fighter, he's looking at something, okay? But there's nothing major going on because he's still way up there. He's waiting for those game fish, whatever it is. And understand that a frigate will follow dolphin, but will he follow wahoo? Will he follow tuna? He'll follow everything. He'll follow anything that's going to force forage and bait up toward the surface where he can swoop down and grab it, primarily flying fish, right? That's, that's the ticket for frigates is they wait for the dolphin to push the flying fish up toward the surface. The flying fish comes out of the water, skitters across the surface. The frigate dive bombs and grabs it. What an amazing hunter. I mean, I'm just always fascinated by frigates. You also know that frigates will eat other birds, okay, and they'll pick off those little birds right out of the sky, which is pretty cool to watch. Pretty vicious, but cool. So anyhow, a frigate is an absolutely great sign, especially when it's low to the water, because that means that the dolphin primarily are pushing bait up toward the surface and they're close to the surface. When you see small little groups of birds, two or three, four or five, just a handful, and they're moving slowly, okay, slowly. Like in other words, they're not going crazy like those big flocks that are, that are moving with those schools of tuna. They're active, they're close to the water. You can see they're not just looking, and what I mean by looking, oftentimes we've been out there and you're like, oh, there's a bird, and he's just woo, 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 just flying and flying as if nothing's going on. You can tell he's not in feeding mode. He doesn't see anything. He's just moving. He's maybe looking or just flying. But you can tell birds that are feeding, okay? Birds that are actively working. And when you see those small groups of three, four, five birds, that's, that's where you want to fish, right there. Okay? That's where you want to fish. And if they're moving south, if the birds themselves are moving south, that is an absolutely awesome indicator that there are large dolphin in the area. How do we know that? How do we know that? Anybody know? Okay. Geographic. National Geographic, he said. <laughs> Damn, you're right. <laughs> because small dolphin, the little peanuts and the chickens and the little schoolies, they swim with the current. Big dolphin feed into the current. They're bigger and stronger much stronger, and they're capable of sustaining a feeding pattern into the strong Gulf Stream current. We all know the current offshore runs how fast? Three, four knots, even more, five knots sometimes. Okay, you take a two pound, three pound dolphin and say, hey, swim against five knots of current. That's not gonna happen, okay? But a 35 pound dolphin can easily do that easily do that. It's, it's a brilliant predator that's involved, evolved to be an incredible eating machine. So whenever you see those birds moving to the south, again, that's a really good indication that there's big dolphin in the area. So pay attention to the birds. You see birds working, don't make that mistake of number one, running right through the birds. Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever see anybody ever do that? Right? So slow down. Slow down. You see birds out in the distance, pull back the throttle. Pay attention for a second. Slow down and pay attention to what's going on. What direction are the birds moving in? How are they reacting? Are they potentially on top of dolphin? Are they potentially on top of big dolphin? Okay, because remember, we've made that commitment. We want to go out there today and catch slammer dolphin. We don't want to screw around with little three pounders, five pounders. That's not what today is about. Okay, if that's what we wanted to do, then we wouldn't be running and gunning and burning all of this fuel. Okay? And even though catching those small dolphin is fun and there is a time and a place for that, that's not what this seminar is about. It's about you making that commitment on how to catch these bigger fish. And no, it's not going to work out every time, but by you know, using all this information, you'll certainly increase your odds. So pay attention to what those birds are doing and react accordingly. So we know that we're looking for birds. Debris is another thing that we look for, right? 
What could be debris? And we're not talking about weed lines, because we'll talk about weed in a second. What else could we find floating out there? A pallet. You know, everybody say, you know what's funny? I gotta be honest with you. The dream, it's a dream. I found a pallet. You know, right? Everybody says, oh, I was out there, man. Look for pallets. How many pallets are floating out in the ocean? I'm not saying there's not a lot of them, but how many people have, literally, be honest with me, how many people have stumbled across a wooden pallet? There's a lot of pallets out there, right? I mean, it's like two dozen people. I think once in 20 years. There's a pallet right there. How many dolphins were on it? A couple. A couple, okay, because you and 500 other guys stumbled across the same pallet. Yeah, no, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And keep in mind, I see a couple of hands raising. I'll certainly answer all of the questions you have at the end of the seminar. Hopefully, I'll touch on whatever your questions are. Otherwise, at the end of the seminar, I'm going to be up here for as long as possible to answer all your questions. So, of course, a pallet would be awesome, right? That's like the, uh, the holy grail of debris is a wooden pallet. What else? Tree, you know, trees. A pond frond, okay, buckets, a square grouper. <laughs> Do we all know what a square grouper is? Okay. I found one. That's a different seminar. Call me later. <laughs> okay. So in turn, debris, you know, a floating pallet, uh, old discarded fishing gear, like commercial fishing gear, right? Like the high flyers, the, the poles with the styrofoam that stick into the water. Oftentimes, if they trail a rope or any kind of discarded line, like a rope. Um, refrigerator doors, we have found, you know, anything like that. But we always find that the more natural material attracts more dolphin. The, of course, wood versus plastic. You can find a floating cooler out there, and you know what's going to be in that cooler? A triple tail, right? A triple tail is going to be sitting right inside that cooler. But oftentimes, there won't be any dolphin. You find a tree, okay, a tree that's just encrusted in barnacles with all sorts of life around it. Oh my God, you just hit the mother load. Literally hit the mother load. So, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that we can find or that we can stumble across, and we really need to keep a close eye on it. Rafts, like discarded rafts from Cuba and stuff like that. There was a period of time years ago where there were literally dozens of rafts that people were stumbling across that had dolphin all over them. I'll tell you a funny story on the, the strangest thing that I stumbled across that had dolphin all over it. And that was a guy floating around. A guy, a man, okay, floating in the ocean. Twelve, I'm going to tell you. Was alive and I think he died. So in turn, we're out there, uh, this honest to God story, okay, honest to God, we're out there about 10, 12 miles off the beach, way out in the distance. I see a Coast Guard cutter, I see a Coast Guard helicopter. I don't think anything of it. I know they're looking for something, they're not looking for me. Okay, we're trolling along, little choppy, two to fours. I'm at the wheel, my brother in the back, one other guy, we're trolling. I see a frigate, right? So, of course, what am I doing? I'm looking up at the frigate. About half hour before that, my buddy had spotted a tree in the water, literally like a large tree trunk, and we trolled all around it and didn't catch any dolphin by that tree. And we continued to move on, and I'm now miles and miles away from the tree, and I'm following this frigate, just looking up in the sky. And I hear my buddy go, hey, Mike, there's that tree. And I kind of glance over real quick, and I see something floating in the water, and I go back up looking at the dolphin, and then it hits me. It hits me that that tree was five miles away from where we are. Okay, that's not a tree. And I turn around and look, and I see something move, and I realize that's a guy floating in the water out in the middle of the ocean which of course is not something you expect to see. So I immediately now realize that the Coast Guard is looking for this guy. What else would they be looking for? They're five miles away from him, so I don't know if I would count on the Coast Guard to find you, okay, but they were looking for this guy. I immediately call him as I turn the boat. I head over to the guy. We pull up right alongside of him. My adrenaline, of course, is going crazy. I turn around. I lift the guy right up in the boat. He's a small guy, about that big, completely covered in 
what appeared to be tar. He had a uh, life jacket on, but it was covered in tar. He was an employee on a freighter, okay, and he was, I don't know, painting, I don't know what he was doing, and fell off the freighter the night before and was floating all night long. Okay? And nobody could see him. He had dark hair, dark skin. He was from India. I'm not sure where. That's what he looked like. And again, his life jacket was completely covered in tar. So you, you didn't even see, all you saw was black in the water. You didn't even see anything bright. So it was very hard to find him. I pick him up. I throw him in the back of the boat. My brother and my buddy are beating up on dolphin. This guy dying in the back of my boat. They're just flipping dolphin in the boat, one after the other. In five minutes, I got helicopters, I got FWC, I got Coast Guard. I turn around, the boat's covered in blood, and there's dolphins just everywhere, flipping all around the boat. I'm like, what are you guys doing? This guy's dead, you know, and they're just beating him up. So dolphin, moral of the story, moral of the story, dolphin will swim around anything, right? You know, they'll swim around anything. Literally brought the guy in. I don't know what ever happened to him. I hope he's happily ever after, but I never heard from him. I'm a little bit offended. I saved his life. He never even sent me a thank you card. But that's a different set, you know, story altogether. So in turn, you know, we're looking for whatever we can find out there as far as debris is concerned. Of course, the birds we're looking for. Then the weed lines, the most obvious. But remember that not all weed is created equal. Okay, it's not, sometimes you go out there and you see this grass that's floating around on the surface that looks like somebody mowed their lawn. Okay, the eel grass, it's really nasty kind of stuff. Does that hold dolphin? No. Then you find sargasm and it's really dark and dingy and dead and there's no bait anywhere underneath it at all. It's just really dark kind of stuff. Does that hold dolphin? No. And then you find these weed lines that are vibrant. It's alive, it's gold, it's vibrant, it's floating, and there's bait everywhere darting around. Is that the kind of weed line I want to fish? You're damn right that's the kind of weed line I want to fish. Okay, so you've got to pay attention. Just because you stumbled across a weed line doesn't mean you hit the mother load. Okay, it does not mean you hit the mother load. Not all weed is going to hold the fish. So when you're running and gunning and you do see that weed line, again, spend a couple minutes. Take a close look at it. Is it worth my effort? Is it worth me trying to catch something on this weed line? Is it likely that there are fish on this weed line? And you know, something really interesting kind of took place a little while back that I never really thought of in this great detail. We were out there filming a show on dolphin fishing, and there was a big weed patch about, I don't know, the size of this area right here, solid. I mean, just carpet of weed big round patch and one of my camera guys jumped in the water to take some underwater footage we were catching a bunch of schoolies okay and we were tagging these fish it was a show on tagging dolphin and he jumped in and this is now i don't know 10 11 a.m blazing hot out like it you know like the weather we're experiencing right now okay really really hot out he jumped in and he's doing some filming and he gets back in the boat and he says, you would not believe, you would not believe the temperature difference underneath that weed patch versus outside the weed patch. Because he swam, right? He was under the weed patch, literally. Got some really cool footage, okay? And literally, he said it felt like it was a 20 degree difference, okay? Now, I don't know if it was 20 degrees, but he said it was just a substantial, substantial, much, much cooler under that solid weed patch. And we always associate weed and we say, you know, the dolphin are here. You know why they're here? Because the food, right? That's what we say. We say the dolphin are under this weed because the food is here. But we never stop and say, hey, the dolphin are underneath here because it's air conditioning, <laughs> right? I mean, because they're getting out of the blazing sun and they're in a much more comfortable, cooler environment underneath that weed line or underneath the weed patch. So I thought that that was very interesting and I think that you should remember that as well, that the more well formed and the thicker those weed patches, the cooler that water is directly underneath it in the shade. And as a matter of fact, you can see even up on the monitor right now, totally coincidence, but here's this well formed weed line with all of this bait, okay, underneath it. And again, 
it's because it's so much cooler there and there's so much forage in that weed line. Everything lives in the weed. You know, I, I like to, when I find a weed line, I scoop up a big handful with like a bait net and I shake it right on the deck of the boat or on the gunnel. Okay, I shake it. What comes out of that weed? Puffers, sargasm fish, seahorses, crabs, shrimp, everything everybody said is 100% right. There's so much life that lives in that weed. And of course, you can follow the food chain up from there. And obviously, that's why dolphins associate with weed lines. It's a buffet, okay? And they cruise up and down the weed line waiting for an opportunity to eat something. That is also why it's believed that dolphin, you know, Dolphin are uh, amazing colors, right? Aren't they? Everybody loves dolphin. One of the main reasons we love dolphin is because of this, because of their colors. Well, they're gold. They can turn gold. They can turn blue. They can turn green. They can change all of these colors depending on their mood. And they literally can get right in there in that gold sargasm weed and turn gold, completely camouflage themselves, and literally swim in the weed to dislodge crabs and shrimp. And that's oftentimes when you're, you ever fillet a dolphin and in its belly is sargasm weed? Okay, he didn't eat the weed. He ate whatever was in that weed and digested the weed along with it. Okay, the sargasm along with that crab or shrimp or bait fish, obviously he ate that too. He wasn't looking for salad with his steak. Okay, that's not what he was doing. So in turn, again, pay attention to that weed. The more lively that weed is, the more likely it is to hold those bigger dolphin. Once you stumble across any of those things and you decide, hey, I want to try fishing here. Okay, I want to try and catch some bigger dolphin here. You have a couple of options. One option is obvi obviously to stop and to throw some chunks, right? We all know this. If ever, whenever you go offshore and you want to go dolphin fishing, you better have a five gallon bucket of chunks on the boat, or at the very least, a couple of five pound boxes of frozen glass minnows, something that you can chunk and throw in the water to attract dolphin to you and to keep them there. Okay, so that is one option. But what often happens when you chunk, anybody ever go out there, come across a weed line, I throw a scoop of chunks, and the boat's surrounded by 30-pound dolphin? No. The boat's surrounded by 3-pound dolphin. That often happens, right? Okay, bar jacks and, and the little schoolies and stuff like that, which is okay. It's okay, because if you sit there for a minute and you chunk, and you attract all of those smaller dolphin, the little schoolies, you have an option. You can grab a rod, and you can start catching those little schoolies and you know, spend your time doing that if that's what you so choose, or you can wait it out. Because guess what is very likely underneath and deeper than all of those smaller dolphin? The slammers. Okay? The big fish are not dumb. They don't need to exert all of that energy to chase around those stupid little chunks. They sit down there and they wait, and they wait, and they look up, and they wait, and they'll pick off you know, whatever chunks make it through the smaller dolphin. And then if there's a weak small dolphin, guess what they're eating? The little weak small dolphin. So oftentimes, it's a good idea to fish deeper below all of those smaller fish. You're not going to see a fish this size. You're not going to see a dolphin this big swimming side by side with dolphin this big. Okay? It's, anybody ever see that? You're never going to see it. Okay? Because all of those little dolphin that are this big or this big, they know that this guy is going to eat them. Okay, so they don't swim right next to them and say, hey, what's up, Joe? No. Okay, they're out of there. They don't swim together. Dolphins swim in the same size. You know, the same size fish stick together. Okay, they stick together. But oftentimes, deeper, deeper in the water column is where you're going to find those larger fish. And you need, A, a bigger bait, because if you put a small pilchard in the water or a chunk in the water, what's going to happen? The little guys are going to get it. If you catch a 20-inch, does anybody here work for the FWC? <laughs> Be honest. Anybody here a cop? OK. I'm not telling you to do this. 
I'm not saying this. I'm not telling you I've never done this. Okay, I'm not telling you that either. I'm telling you that it would be interesting if you caught a small dolphin, okay? Interesting, I wonder what would happen if I caught a small dolphin and I put a hook in that small dolphin and I fed that small dolphin out and I let it swim around. And you know, maybe I did that with three or four small dolphins around the boat, okay? And I just sat there while there's all these other dolphins and I continue to feed all of these other dolphins to keep them active and to keep them around the boat. And I wonder what would happen if there were four other, three, four other hooked dolphins swimming around that were injured, that were easy to catch. I, I don't know what the end result of that would be, okay? I really don't know. And again, you, uh, all right, you guys are picking up what I'm throwing down, right? All right. So, into, right. now, I don't know if I was going to hook that fish, and I'm not saying that I'm going to, I'm saying if I was down by the anal fin is where I would hook that fish, because I would assume it would swim deeper in the water column, okay? That might be an idea, but again, I don't know. You know, I've never done that. I do know that if I'm out there and that scenario unfolded, and if I wasn't so anxious, because suddenly what happens is you go out there, you got three or four buddies on the boat, the boat gets surrounded by a school of three, four pound dolphin. Everybody's like, Wah! give me a rod! And they go running for whatever rod is right there because they want to catch those fish, right? That's what happens. But again, that's not what we're talking about. Stop, slow down. You're not there, you know, would you rather catch 10, three pounders or one 30 pounder. I know I'd rather catch that guy. I'd rather catch the one 30 pounder and then I'll catch the 10 three pounders. But you know, I want quality over quantity. So in turn, you know, remember that you've making that commitment because you can go out any day and, and catch those smaller ones. Those are easy to catch, but to make that commitment to catch the bigger one is, is obviously takes that commitment and it doesn't always pay off but that's the bait that I would use if I was going to do that because any other bait that you put in the water, what's going to happen? It's going to get eaten by the smaller dolphin. So that's something to, to keep in mind. If you're fishing that part of the weed line, maybe you found something floating, a branch, a pallet, a guy, whatever it is, you know, like we talked about in, in that same scenario unfolded, and I don't know, 15, 20 minutes went by and you didn't get a bite, are you gonna stay or are you gonna move on? Move on, move on, okay? Because if there were bigger dolphin underneath them, which there not always are, but if there were bigger dolphin underneath them, you would know it within 15 minutes, I promise you. Now just keep in mind, be prepared, because what else would potentially eat a juvenile dolphin? Wahoo, Wahoo. Marlin. okay, a marlin. 100% a marlin, okay? Yeah. Do not be surprised if you're out there and you see a blue marlin. What do blue marlin eat? Blue marlin eat dolphin, okay? Blue marlin eat 30 pound dolphin, okay? <laughs> you don't think they're gonna gobble up a three pound dolphin? That's, that's nothing, that's a snack for them. It's a peanut, <laughs> well, literally it's a peanut, okay? So keep that in mind, be prepared. I point that out because if you're gonna drop down a larger bait, you know, you may want to think about doing it on a little bit of a beefier rod, right? Because what's going to potentially eat that? You're not looking for a 10-pound dolphin. This is overkill for a 10-pound dolphin. It's not overkill for a 30 to 50-pound dolphin. And it's not overkill for that once, once. Because you're not going to go out there and every day encounter a blue marlin. I've been fishing here off this coast for 30 years. I have caught one blue marlin in 30 years, right out front here in 600, 650 feet of water. So how many people here have caught a blue marlin right out front here? Okay, one, two, three, and me four. So literally a very, very small number. So when that opportunity presents itself, do you want to be holding a 15 pound spinning rod in your hand? Okay, do you want to be holding a light bait caster in your hand when that 200, 300 pound blue marlin eats that? 20 inch dolphin, okay? No, you don't want to be under gun. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity out front. So remember what you're doing, okay? At the very least too, 
you know, even when we are running and gunning, I, you know, and I should say this a different way. I don't care what you're doing. You know, I'm the kind of fisherman where when I load my boat in the morning, I kind of think of all different sorts of scenarios as to what may unfold. Having a pretty beefy spinning outfit rigged and ready with a hook at all times, if this is not sitting in a rod holder on your boat somewhere, you're missing opportunities because the opportunity of a big dolphin often happens when you least expect it. We're at deep dropping, my brother and my nephew. We're in 600 feet of water. We're on the bottom with a deep drop rod, and whenever we deep drop rod, we've got two spinners out with two squid floating, you know, drifting as we're deep dropping. Out of nowhere, big school of dolphin comes by. One of them is a really, really nice fish. I had another rod ring with a spinner, I mean, with a hook threw it out there and was fortunate to catch a nice fish in the low 30s. If I, by the time I had to find the hook and tie it on, that fish could have been gone. Could have been gone. So make sure that you're ready for any opportunity. So anyhow, back to the running and gunning. 15, 20 minutes, I don't catch a fish, I'm off to the next thing. I'm looking and looking and looking. Weed lines, birds, debris, and I'm focusing all of my efforts on those small areas. Another way to fish or investigate that area is to troll, right? And you don't have to, do, you know, when people think trolling, oh my God, I gotta put out eight lines or 10 rods and this full spread and my outriggers and you know how long it takes me to set a 10 rod trolling spread, okay? For me, it, it doesn't take that long, I'm pretty dialed in, but it still takes a lot of time. Your average guy, Hey, do me a favor, set a 10-line trolling spread. That's not even going to happen, okay? He's, he's going to quit at six, you know, and say, I'm not fishing more than six lines. Are you crazy? You know, but keep in mind, you don't have to do that. Two lines. If you're investigating something, have two trolling rods right behind the boat. Again, this is the rod that I'm going to investigate with, okay, a six-foot conventional outfit. Reel is loaded with 700 yards of 30 pound braid. I don't care what I hook on this, it is not getting away from me. Okay, I've got 700 yards of 30 pound braid, and then I've got 100 yards of 50 pound fluorocarbon on top of the 700 yards of braid. It's light, it's comfortable, I can fish with this all day even if I wanted to hold it under my arm. And certainly in a rod holder, it's easy peasy. Okay, and it's still not overkill, you know, it's not a 50 wide. It's not an 80 wide, or you know, not that anyone's dolphin. Anybody dolphin fishing with an 80 wide? Okay, but certainly there are people dolphin fishing with 50 wides. Way overkill. Okay, you can lighten it up. Everything nowadays, the trend is lighter, stealthier, smaller, more comfortable, and you'll be more successful. Anyhow, two rods. That's all you have to do to investigate. If you have rigged ballyhoo, okay, put two naked ballyhoo behind the boat. Circle around that debris. If there's anything in the air, if there are any dolphin there, they are going to find your two ballyhoo. Spend 10, what's that? No, not if you're, I mean, you can, absolutely. You can put two ballyhoo with skirts, you can put two ballyhoo with little chugger heads, or you can put two naked ballyhoo and just troll them behind the boat, swimming ballyhoo, circle around the debris, go right up the edge of the weed line, circle around the guy floating, whatever it is that you find out there, and give it 10, 15 minutes. If there are any schoolies, if there are any dolphin in the area, you're gonna know it, okay? You're not trying, remember, you're just investigating, okay? You're not setting this full spread. So, and, and it's a great way to investigate something because it's very easy. It's very quick. The two rods are in the rod holders. They're right there. They're rigged and ready. The baits are on there. They're sitting in a cooler with ice. Okay, you've got one guy or two guys behind the boat. It's rare that you're gonna go offshore dolphin fishing alone. I like to fish alone a lot. I don't like to go dolphin fishing alone. Anybody like to go dolphin fishing alone? Okay. Joe, me and Jim, okay? <laughs> you guys are good. Go together. Anyhow, you know, so it's very easy to just pull back the throttles and say, hey, put those two baits back there. Put one short, put one at 100 feet and one at 200 feet. Why? Because now you can do figure eights and not get tangled. You can circle right around the debris or the whatever it is that you stumbled across and not get tangled. If you have eight, 10, 12 lines behind the boat, are you gonna get tangled? Yep. Yes, okay. Are you gonna get tangled with two, one short, one long? 
It's not going to happen, okay? It's, it's dumb proof is what I call it. You can literally do figure eights. You're not going to get tangled if you keep it simple. Not everything has to be complicated. Sometimes, you know, there's an expression, KISS, K-I-S-S. Anybody know what that means? Keep it simple, stupid, okay? That's all. Put two baits back there. If you hook up, now you can adjust accordingly. Maybe I want to put a, you know, more of a trolling spread and really focus on this area. Maybe I want to throw baits, whatever it is that you want to do from that point. So that's another way to investigate. So in addition to the running and gunning, Okay, we also have an opportunity, of course, to troll. Everybody loves to troll. I like to troll. Trolling is super exciting, or it could also be boring as hell, right? If you go out there, one guy, I'm not going to mention who, okay, was coming home from the Bahamas, I'm not saying who, and trolled for 53 miles and caught in 53 miles. Zero. Now, that's not his fault. He had to troll for 53 miles. Unfortunately, he had an engine problem. Otherwise, of course, he would have said, hey, this isn't working, and I'm coming home, right? Okay. But because of an engine problem, decided to troll home. But 53 miles of trolling without getting a bite. He's a good angler. He's successful. He knows what he's doing. It's not like he was trolling the wrong stuff. He just didn't get a bite. You know, you're not going to catch him every day. What? How much were they? 20 bucks, real quick. All right. You know. So in turn, it's going to happen. And when that happens, trolling can be really boring. But then when you hook up, it can be super exciting. You know what I'm saying? So it's like long periods of boredom with short periods of sheer pandemonium. Okay? Now when you're looking for the bigger dolphin, where am I going to troll? Let's, let me say it a different way. A lot of open water out there. I'm going dolphin fishing tomorrow. I'm looking for big dolphin. I'm not looking for the schoolies. And you know what? I'm going to go out there. Very similar to running and gunning. I got to see something, right? Something has to, something has to say, hey, Mike, start trolling here. Okay? Something has to slap me in the face and say, fish here. Okay? A combination of something. May it be birds. May it be debris. May it be wood lines. May it be a rip. May it be a color change, may it be flying fish everywhere, because sometimes out in open water, when you, it's not every day when we find things floating. It's not every day there are wood lines out there. Lately, there hasn't been a problem. This year hasn't been a problem. There's more sargasm out there this year than ever before. Anybody know why that is? Okay, they believe it's because of climate change, that water temperatures are rising, and sargasm is actually an algae and it blooms and it grows on the surface. It is the only algae in creation that grows floating on the surface of the ocean. So a pile that's this big today could be this big in a week, okay? And it'll just keep growing and growing, okay, out on the ocean. It's an algae. And because water temperatures are rising, they believe that's why there's so much more weed this year. And keep in mind, this time of the year, what is our wind patterns? We get, in the summertime, we get southeast, you know, predominantly southerly, southeasterly breezes. So the weed is being pushed, pushed towards shore, which is why there's so much weed on the beaches every day now, and that's been a huge problem as well all year long. Nevertheless, something has to stop me and say, put your lines out here, Mike, fish here, okay? And it could be any of those things or a combination of those things. It's great to be able to go out there and find a well-formed weed line, and there's birds picking on the weed line. There's a frigate 10 feet over the weed line, okay, cruising around, and there's bait fish jumping everywhere, and there's nobody, there's no other boats anywhere. It's the dream. It's, uh, whew, hold on. I catch my breath. Okay. <laughs> Man, nevertheless. That would be nice, right? But we all know that's not reality. Okay, it's not reality. We're lucky if we find anything. And there are some days we don't find anything at all. And then, of course, there are other days when we do find that combination. And that's the key. What I've found recently, and when I say recently, over the last year, two, three years, it's not about stumbling across a weed line any longer. It's about stumbling across a weed line that has bait. Or it's not about finding birds feeding. It's finding birds that are feeding on top of something floating, like it's the combination, 
of at least two forms of something or another, that's what's going to hold the most fish, not just one form any longer. So I decide, okay, something has stopped me. I want to fish here. We are going to troll. Again, when I'm looking for the bigger dolphin, the same trolling outfit, I've got a set of six of them. This is what I'm fishing. Okay, and when I'm fishing for smaller dolphin and looking for quantity versus quality, we may fish 8, 10, 12 lines. Okay, my 39 CV, I've got 20 foot taco graphite poles with triple spreaders. I can fish three, three, four, five, six, seven. I can keep going, okay, and fish literally 12 lines easily. When you're looking for big dolphin, do you want to fish 12 lines? No. You know what's going to happen if you hook? a 35, 40 pound dolphin, and you have 12 lines in the water. He's gonna eat all 12. <laughs> the same guy that found the square grouper, right? You're gonna get in such a tangle that you very likely are gonna lose that fish, right? And unlike the smaller fish that you can control much easier, the bigger fish you can't control that easy. You hook a big slammer dolphin that's 30, 40 pounds, you're in for a fight, boys and girls. Okay, you're not getting that fish in the boat in five minutes and going Phew, and flipping them over the side. You're in for a 30 to 45 minute battle. Okay, I, mean, I don't care what tackle you have, unless you're cranking that thing on a 50 wide low to an 80 pound line, even then. Okay, even then you're in for a battle. With this smaller stuff, these big fish fight. Everybody loves dolphin because they jump, they taste great, they look great, but they fight. They're an absolutely great game fish. They will fight till the death. As a matter of fact, they'll fight beyond the death. You gaff them and put them in the boat. Anybody ever have a big dolphin go poof, right back in the water? Okay, how many times does that happen? Okay. Same guy who trolled for 53 miles and didn't catch anything. Okay in the core and jump back out. It happens, these things don't give up. They will fight till the very, very end, okay? So in turn, remember also, think about this. The bigger dolphin are not a schooling fish like the smaller dolphin. So there's not 100 of them, there's not 50 of them, there's not 30 of them, there might be three of them, okay? There might just be a few of them. And I'm, I'm thrilled, you know, everybody says, hey, when you hook a dolphin or when you're dolphin fishing and you catch dolphin, what's a great tactic, what's a great trick to use in order to keep the dolphin around the boat? Keep him in the water. Keep him in the water. So you hook a dolphin on the troll, he's five pounds, he's eight pounds, whatever it is, you reel him in, you're anxious to get him in the boat. If you're like most people, you don't have the patience to say, okay, let me just leave him in the water. He's going to be fine, okay? But if you want to catch more, 20 feet behind the boat, 25 feet, he doesn't have to be right here next to the boat. A lot of people make that mistake. They reel him up, go, leave him right there next to the boat. No, don't leave him right there next to the boat. Leave him over there. Leave him 20 feet away from the boat, okay? Right there. And oftentimes, any other dolphin that are in the area will congregate to that fish, right? And you'll turn one fish into two fish, into three fish, and multiple hookups, and if you do it right, you'll swap them. And what I mean by swapping it is the fish that you have hooked, okay, you'll hook another one and you'll reel this one in and leave that one in the water. And so on and so forth. This way there's always one in the water that's really fresh and frisky. Okay, because what happens eventually they go, ooh, they lay on their side, they get tired, they're not putting out those vibes. They're not putting out that energy any longer, that excitement. And the other dolphin lose interest. But if he's in the water and he's freaking out and he's spitting crap out of its mouth that's going in the water, you're still you know, creating all of that interest. So in turn, ideally in that scenario, and we're not talking about catching small ones, but if we were, you would constantly swap out that fish that's close to the boat. With a 30 pound fish, are you leaving them in the water? Hell no, all right, reel up everything else. Get everything else up and out of the way. You know, if you have to, if there's a potential for a tangle, get everything up out, out of the way because you want to focus on catching this bigger quality fish. Now keep in mind, I realize that there could very well be other fish with this big fish. Okay, there could very well be. But if I'm focusing on this 35 pound bull 
and I'm fighting this fish, and I'm thinking there could be other big cows in the area, and we've reeled up all of our trolling gear, am I going to take a spinning rod with a whole squid or a whole ballyhoo and throw it out there? You bet your butt I am, okay, because it's rigged and ready to go. I know that this scenario may unfold. I've prepared myself for this scenario. I think to myself, what could happen? And I kind of play out all of the different scenarios. And I go, well, I'm trolling along, and I'm going to hook a 30, 40-pound dolphin, potentially a 25-pound dolphin, whatever, a big slammer, a nice quality fish. It's very likely that there are other fish, even one other one with it, that's going to swim right alongside it. You know, the bull, if you hook a cow, the bull didn't abandon his girl. Okay, he didn't ditch. He's somewhere. He might not be right next to her. But he's somewhere, right there in the air, right there, wondering what's going on and why you're pulling her away from him. Okay, he's somewhere in that area. And as that fish is fighting, it too is getting excited. And if you throw another bait in the water, certainly that fish may come up and eat that bait. And vice versa, if you're hooked up to the bull, the girls didn't leave the guy. They're in the area somewhere. So it's always a great idea to be prepared for that scenario. Okay. When you're trolling, as I mentioned, you don't want to have that giant spread of 8, 10, 12 lines. Five. I fish five rods is plenty in that scenario. Ideally, off the outriggers is going to be a large horse ballyhoo, which is just a large ballyhoo underneath an Islander-style lure. There are many, many types of skirted lures in the world in my opinion, there should be no dolphin fisherman in this room who does not have islanders on his boat. Does everybody own islander lures? Okay, if you do not, that shelf right over there. Okay, use a gift card that they gave you and buy one. If you only had to choose one color, I have two favorite colors, blue and white and white and blue. Those are my two favorite color patterns, okay? I've got a whole box full of other ones that are pink, orange, yellow, green, purple, black, blah, blah, blah. And they all work. I've caught fish on them all. But if I only had one option, it would be blue and white or white and blue. They come in different style heads. This is more of a bullet style head. This is more of a chugger style head. Off the outriggers, this is a better option, the chugger style head. Okay, it puts out a tremendous amount of commotion and bubbles and smoke, which attract dolphin. They like all of that commotion, those bigger dolphin. And it prevents the ballyhoo from being washed out as much as the bullet style heads. So this would be a better bet on the trolling side. So off your outriggers, large ballyhoo. You want a big bait. Why do you want a big bait? A big dolphin, you want that fish to commit. You want that fish to say, I'm, it's worth racing up there to eat whatever that is that Mike's trolling behind his CV. Okay? And if you're pulling a small little feather, I'm not saying you're not going to catch dolphin. I'm not saying you're not going to catch big dolphin because elephants eat peanuts. Right? They do. But day in and day out, I want a big bait. I also want to avoid, I want to deter the smaller ones. I don't want to hook a two-pound fish. I don't want to hook a five-pound fish. That's not why I'm there on that particular day. I want to hook a 35-pound fish. So I'm going to fish a big bait. So big horse ballyhoo off the riggers, and then a couple of artificial lures. I absolutely love the Molecraft soft heads. Okay, what does this look like? My, my shirt. <laughs> I said, what does this look like? She says, your shirt. <laughs> I love that. What does this look like? My pants. No. <laughs> Okay, looks like a bonita. So I keep it very simple. Dolphin and a bonita. What are they eating out there? Dolphin and bonita. You know, that's their primary forage. This isn't rocket science. You know, keep it simple. Remember that. But make sure that your lures are rigged properly. You never know because what else may eat this lure? A billfish, potentially a wahoo as well. So this is heavier leader material. Okay, so keep that in mind. Plus, I can pull these fast. Along with the islanders, you know, covering up the horse ballyhoo, I can easily troll 10 to 12 knots. I'm not that guy. 
that trolls at four to six knots. The only time I'm going to troll slow is if I'm pulling naked ballyhoo. Okay, naked ballyhoo, you can troll slow. I want to troll fast. Why? Because I want to cover ground. If you troll over 20 miles today and I troll over 40 miles today just using round numbers, who's more likely going to find a 30-pound dolphin? It's a numbers game, people. It's a law of averages with numbers. The more ground you cover, the more likely you are going to be to find these fish. So I troll a spread that I can pull faster. My fifth rod, fifth and final rod, is a deep diving plug, a Rapala X-Rap. Okay, a Magnum X-Rap. This dives 20 feet below the surface. What does this look like? My shirt, again. Okay, looks like a baby dolphin. What do dolphins eat? Dolphin. I keep it really, really simple. Okay, now obviously these are available in all sorts of colors. Let's just use this as an example. Anybody ever see a bait fish that looks like this? Okay, now I'm not saying that's not going to work. It certainly will because we know that fish don't see color the way that you and I see color. They see shades. But still, I like to match the hatch. So I've always had the most success with my deep diving plug in the dolphin pattern or something purple that looks like a bonita, that looks like a black fin, that looks like something that they're eating right out here. Put this right down the middle. Okay, troll it right down the middle of your spread. Two, ba two horse ballyhoo on the islanders off the riggers, and two shorter, closer to the boat, the chuggers. That's your spread. You again can do figure eights if you needed to. Don't be afraid to pull these very close to the boat. When I say close to the boat, you know, people often have the misconception that their lures, their trolling lures, need to be 350 yards out. Okay, when you are targeting, for example, yellowfin tuna, you want your trolling spread way behind the boat. Okay, when you are targeting dolphin, they like that commotion. What do you think dolphin think? What do you think they see? As I'm trolling along, they're looking up. Are they going, oh wait, that's a 39 CV. Huh, no, I don't like that boat. Oh look, that's a 26 Dusky. No, don't like that boat either. You know, of course that's not what they see. They see all of this white water, all of this commotion. They see the white water being generated by the engines, by the propellers. It looks like a feeding scenario. It looks like they're a game fish feeding, okay? And then within that white water, they see this little bonita come racing by. Should it be way back there? It should be right here in this feeding scenario. So don't be afraid to put this 30 to 50 feet behind the boat. Don't eat it. Don't come, don't let, don't practically eat this bait 10 feet behind the engines. Okay? And also when you see all of this white water behind the boat being generated from your wake and from the propellers, that white water does not go five feet below the surface. It's right on the surface. It's right up on top. Okay? And then it dissipates. It's clear. You know, we've all seen, and if you haven't, there's this magical thing nowadays called YouTube, okay, type in trolling lure videos and see the videos that are shot with cameras of trolling lures. I don't care what kind it is from below the surface, right? We've all seen them. And you can see that that white water is right on the surface. The fish can see this. They can see it in the wash. They can see it. Don't be afraid that it's too close to the boat, okay? Don't worry about putting it way, way back there. It's a very easy trolling spread. It's very effective. I'm certain that in that bait cooler right there, there are frozen horse ballyhoo or rigged horse ballyhoo. You don't need a lot of them because you're not fishing a spread of 12 baits or 12 lures. You only need two at a time. You know, you only need two at a time. So, and again, you could purchase them unrigged and rig them yourself, or you can purchase them rigged. Some of the baits, some of the horse ballyhoo are available on monofilament and some are available on wire. Should you not fish wire or should you maybe fish wire? Anybody have any input? I don't think it would hurt to fish wire. You fish mono because you believe that you're going to get the most bites, but what else offshore eats horse ballyhoo? Wahoo, okay. However, remember this. When you purchase pre-rigged horse ballyhoo or if you rig them yourself, are you going to rig it on 50-pound mono? No. 
okay? Bump it up to 80 or 100 pound at the minimum for your leader material, okay? Because again, you're targeting these bigger fish. And not that dolphins have huge teeth like wahoo or king mackerel, but they do have abrasive teeth. And if you fish really light leader and you have a prolonged battle, okay, that may last 45 minutes, okay, a prolonged battle with a big dolphin that has abrasive teeth and you have 50 pound leader, we know what the end result of that could be, what we call premature tackle failure. That ever happened to anybody? Premature tackle failure. Only one person is raising their hand, okay? That means something failed before it should have. Your leader broke, your hook pulled, something failed. Every single fisherman in this room is raising, it should be raising their hand because it's happened to all of us, okay? So think about, again, what you're doing. It's a real easy trolling spread. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's quick to deploy, especially if everybody knows exactly where each bait goes. You control all day long up and down the weed lines. You control south, you control north. Remember that trolling south, you know, some days going south or trolling south is gonna be more productive than other days trolling north. Every day is different out there. You're obviously gonna focus your efforts on all of the things that we discussed, the weed lines, you know, the debris, color changes, rips that are created by different, different currents that collide up against each other, all of these different things attract bait fish. And what does bait fish attract? F game fish, right? You just gotta follow the food chain. When you hook a big dolphin, take your time. You put all of this time and effort into going out there finding these fish and hooking these fish, and obviously the time has come, you're hooked up, you know it's a big dolphin because it jumped out of the water, and you're like, oh my God, look at that thing. And you know what's really cool about dolphin? Dolphin are one of those fish that are bigger than you think they are. Does that make sense? You see a dolphin jump and you're like, oh, he's like eight pounds, and it's like a 15 pound fish. And then you see one jump and you're like, oh, that's a nice fish, he's like 20 pounds, he's even bigger than that. You know, they, they tend to be bigger than what they appear to be because when they're jumping, they're usually out away from the boat. As that fight continues, the fish tires, right? As he gets closer to the boat, he's getting more and more tired, but do not think that that fish still doesn't have another run in him because once a big dolphin comes up next to the boat, he's not just gonna throw in the white towel and say, go ahead, gaff me, kill me, you're mine, or I'm yours. Okay, that's not gonna happen. He's going again to flip out. And the closer the fish is to the boat, the more likely it is to get away. Why is that? Because you don't have that elasticity between the rod tip and the fish any longer. Monofilament is like a giant rubber band. So when a dolphin jumps and is shaking its head like this, okay, the monofilament absorbs that shock and the hook does not pull out. However, when the fish is right next to the boat and there is no long leader between you and the fish, something's gonna give if that fish jumps and starts shaking its head. And oftentimes, big dolphin are lost right next to the boat. So don't be afraid to back off on the drag a little bit when the fish is next to the boat and pay very close attention. You know, sometimes everybody knows, you know, when you're fighting tarpon, how you have to lean into them when the tarpon jumps. Same thing with dolphins. Sometimes you have to lean into them, you know, when they're close to the boat. Attempt to gaff that fish as close to, if not in the head, as possible. Don't gaff a dolphin in the tail, okay? Don't gaff a big dolphin in the tail and try and lift it up and into the boat. Don't make that mistake. Gaff it in the head. However, anytime you get a gaff shot on a 30, 40, 50 pound dolphin, which isn't gonna happen every day, I like to say, take the shot, okay? Take the shot. If you can reach out with that gaff and stick that gaff in it, I don't care where you put it, take that shot, because it may be the only shot that you get, okay? I'm telling you, it may be the only shot that you get. So try and get them where you should, but any shot is better than no shot. Once you get that fish in the boat, be very careful. A big dolphin, a 30 to 50 pound dolphin will destroy your boat. 
Okay? They absolutely are vicious. It's always a good idea to have a fish box open or a cooler open. You get off the fish, you throw it in the box or you throw it in the cooler, shut the lid and sit on it. <laughs> sit on it. You guys are laughing. Who, who is it that said the same guy who drove for 53 miles and you know had one jump out of the cooler? It's gonna happen. I'm telling you, it happens. These fish are super strong. That's why they're called slammers. You know, they're incredibly powerful incredibly fast and agile. And even after you fight them for a prolonged period of time, they still have some juice inside of them. Okay, they really do. So, pay attention to what's going on around you. At the end of the day, there is no secret sauce to catching slam or dolphin other than the first thing I told you, go to Costa Rica, okay? That's the only secret. Other than that, you've got to put in your time, you've got to put in the effort, you've got to pay attention to all of the details, avoid tackle failure, check your leaders, check your knots, you know, make sure that you're fishing quality tackle. The hooks that we fish are the VMC live bait hooks, size 5.0 for smaller baits, 7.0 for bigger baits. My hook size is not determined by the size of the fish that I am targeting. My hook size is determined by the bait that I'm fishing. If I'm fishing a smaller bait, I cannot hide this 7 hook in a smaller bait. And not that dolphin are as keen or, you know, or as line shy and can see as well as tuna, they can't. But the last thing that I want to do is deter a big fish from eating a bait. And trust me, it happens. You ever go out there, dolphin fishing, you're catching them, and then you put stuff in front of them, and they won't touch it. They absolutely won't touch it, no matter what you put in front of them. They swim up to it, they look at it, and they turn away, no matter what you do. That's because they could see your terminal tackle. And also, we, we, one day, we, I don't, it wasn't an experiment we did on purpose, but it was fascinating to me to come back to the office, and we were looking at underwater footage, we were catching dolphin, and we were fishing thin leaders, 20-pound test. And on the monitor, on the, team, on the computer monitor, that 20-pound leader looked like somebody took a black Sharpie in the water. Okay? That we look at and go, that fish can't see that. Oh, yes, it can. It can see that leader, it can see the hook, it can see everything. So I try and minimize my tackle to the bare minimum because I want to be as stealthy as I can be. But I've got to make sure that I use quality tackle. Diamond presentation fluorocarbon. Stronger, lighter, okay, I can go to a lighter leader, but it's quality, I can count on it. The same thing with the VMC hooks, okay? Finally, Finally, pay, you know, I cannot stress this enough. I say it in all of my seminars and I'm going to say it again. One fish can make a big, big difference in your entire trip. Okay? I can tell you if I go out dolphin fishing tomorrow and I come home empty handed, I'm very disappointed. If I come home and this guy, if I come home like this, Look what I caught right here. It's the only fish I caught. I didn't catch any other ones. I just caught this one right here. Am I smiling? Yeah. You bet your butt I'm smiling. So one fish can make a huge difference in the entire outcome of your trip. And by you know, paying attention to all of those little details will, ins will ensure that when your time comes and you have an opportunity at this fish, you'll get them in the boat.